Hey, welcome back to another episode of Lead, Sell, Grow, the Human Experience podcast, everybody. I'm smiling from ear to ear because I got an awesome guest with me. And first, I'm going to introduce him. As a matter of fact, there's no Harry today. Um, so Harry, we miss you and you're missing a really good conversation with our amazing guest. He is a mediocre guitar player. He's a pretty good singer. <laughs> He's a scuba diver and a hilarious person to follow on social media, especially when he's quarantined and going crazy at home. But uh, these are all the reasons. These are not the reasons why, invi- why we invited Mike Kim here today. Here are the reasons why we actually invited him, okay? I personally sought Mike out because he's a marketing powerhouse. He's a freaking genius. He's, he's a brand strategist for business leaders, authors, coaches, kind of like myself. Uh, he's worked with leaders like John Maxwell, and everybody knows how I feel about John Maxwell, Donald Miller, Dr. Daniel Amen. I mean, he's got a list of people who have been on the New York Times bestseller list. He's got a list of people who have been featured on national media like CNN, Fox, all those guys. Um, his podcast has become one of my favorites as I'm running the streets. It's called The Brand You Podcast. It's awesome. And he's the author of his new book that I'm dove into and cannot put it down. And his new book is already a, a Wall Street Journal bestseller and a USA Today bestseller. It's called You Are the Brand. You got to pick up this book. Mike, welcome to the show. Did I miss anything? No, that's everything except for my All social right. security number or something like that. So Eric, uh, thank you, my man, for having me on the show. Uh, it's an honor to be here and I hope to add some value to everybody today. Thanks for being here. I'm sure you're going to add value. So 2012, you quit your job as being a music director at a church. Okay, 2012. I did the math. That's like nine years, I think, right? (laughs) What was your vision back then? Oh, man, my vision was just to get out of what I was doing. Um, You mentioned before I was a mediocre guitar player. That's true. Uh, but in that world, I was good, right? And um, and I was a better piano player, but I didn't play much when I was at that job because so much more of the music was guitar oriented. And um, man, it was a full time job, but it didn't really feel fulfilling. Uh, it didn't feel like me putting together music every week for the same, you know, thousand people. For the rest of my life was going to be a life that was going to make me feel fulfilled. Um, I know you work with a lot of clients on getting sales and, but it's more than that. You know, it's, it's about yes. doing something that you're really proud of. And I wasn't really walking a path in my life where I was building a life worthy of my own respect. Mm-hmm. And so for me at that point, I didn't know what was next. I didn't know this whole internet marketing world existed. I didn't know what professional coaching really was. I just was trying to escape that present negative and move to a future positive, but I didn't know what that looked like. So early on, man, I just wanted to get out of what I was doing and start down a, down a different path. Huh? What was missing for you? Like, how did you know you wanted to get out of that? I met this guy. Okay. That's a great question. I met this guy who is at the quote unquote, top of the mountain in the line of work that I was doing. I flew out to Colorado Springs. This is an incredibly big church. It was about 15 or 20,000 people. They had this, I mean, it looked like a Coliseum. And I emailed this guy, his name was Ross, and this is in 2009. So it's a few years before I quit the job. And I said, hey, I don't know anyone who does what I do. You seem to do it really well. Can I ask you a few questions and, and like, get mentored by you for like an hour i'll fly out to colorado personally just to talk to you and he said why don't you fly out to colorado stay a few days we're hosting a big conference and i'll meet you before the conference starts so i was like cool Um, i was like 30 31 years old at the time i think and i fly out there and eric i tell you when i say this guy was at the top of the mountain it was almost literal because the back office, you know, windows, they were all windows. The whole wall was windows because it was so beautiful there. All I saw were the Rocky Mountains. And I asked myself, if everything goes right in my life over the next 15 years, because he was about 15 years older than me at the time, do I want this guy's life? And I said, no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went back to the hotel 
it was a great conversation. And I, I was like jarred. I didn't know what to do because that was not what I was expecting to feel. I thought I'd be re-energized. I thought I'd have fresh vision. I thought I had fresh energy. And I did for a while, but it also put this like seed in my mind. If everything goes well, do you want this guy's life in 15 years? And I realized, and I say this in the book, life's too short for the wrong career. And I was climbing up this mountain and it was the wrong mountain. Wow. What a powerful lesson to learn at 30 and not at 60. Yeah. <laughs> Although it's probably sure. never too late, right? It's never too late. It's never too late. So I actually copied and pasted some notes. I'm reading your book on Kindle. So I can't, you know, I, I copied some notes and there's something that you say in the, like the book is just amazing because it's full of stories and stories. And I think I, I shared it with you and I reached out to you. One of my favorites is the, the night you're out drinking with your mom and just, just hearing stories from her. That's hilarious. But in your book, and this is through the eyes of an, a marketing expert. I mean, right now you go around, you help organizations and people market themselves better. You say people want to get paid, get laid, or live forever. <laughs> yes. I um, love those that. Are the, <laughs> those, are the, those are the three general markets that most of us as coaches and you know, experts are in. We either help people uh, make more money, <laughs> uh, get better at their relationships, or um, get better at health, right? And so get paid, make more money, get laid, better relationships, or live forever, more health. And so health, well, health, wealth, and relationships are really the big three umbrellas. And I had to kind of like narrow that down. And because I've worked with so many people, and they're not really sure who they want to serve, or they want to do too many different things. Right. And in the, in the beginning, when you, you're building a brand or trying to build a coaching practice or any kind of consultancy or freelancing, whatnot, you really got to focus on one of those general markets. And then once you understand which market you're in, you can niche down even further. But that was just a funny way to say it. I've heard it said that way. And uh, I, I was just like, I got to put this in the book. The people are going to laugh about this one. And I I'm glad you found great. it funny. Yeah, yeah I, think, <laughs> I think I heard Russell Brunson mention something like that. But it, either way, it's phenomenal. Um, so, okay, being a coach now, and I'm going through the, through kind of the area in my area right now where I'm looking to rebrand. I, I hired somebody to do the social media branding. I hired a guy for YouTube. I want everything to look alike. How do people know where to even start? Like, there's so much stuff out there and it's so overwhelming. When you come into an organization, do you have like a like your first three things for someone who hasn't done much branding that they could, you know, easily get the ball rolling. Yeah. In this, in this line of, of work, when you're, you know, coaching and you're sharing your expertise, the first place I start, and this is the first step in the framework that I teach in the book is to flesh out your point of view. Um, because so many people are trying to sell something, but they're not really sure what to say. They're not sure where they stand. So I just ask three simple questions, which I call the PB3, the personal brand three. Um, I couldn't think of a better name. And the questions it. are what, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, I just, the questions are what pisses you off? What breaks your heart? And what's the big problem you're trying to solve? And somewhere in the middle of those three answers is going to be your brand message. It's, it's what you want to say to the world. So it's really interesting because when I, when I work through these questions with people live, one-on-one uh, -on -one or in a group setting, they give me marketing answers, but it's not really what they're feeling on the inside. Hmm. So if I ask someone, well, what pisses you off? What breaks your heart? What's the big problem you're trying to solve? A lot of folks will say, well, uh, I really want to help people with their marketing and their branding. And I'm like, I'm not really sure that you do. I think that's the way that you want to do something deeper. And so I've got to dig into what's deeper. Um, recently, I was coaching a guy named Dwayne. And Dwayne is a marketer, but he does very technical things. He builds funnels and he runs Facebook ads. Not very sexy, not very inspiring. Okay. Um, so he knows what problem he solves. So when I asked him what pisses him off and what breaks his heart, of course, the initial answer was, you know, it really pisses me off that people have bad funnels. I'm like, I don't think that's what gets you up in the morning. 
I don't think that's what you think about first thing when you wake up in the morning. Like, how am I going to build better funnels for people? I really doubt that. So we dug into it. And after a few more questions that started with that one, I discovered that he really hates when people do not feel heard. And the way he runs his marketing agency and the way he runs Facebook ads is he wants to make sure the people you're marketing to feel heard. And I'm like, where does that come from? Dude, he started crying. Wow. He's like, my dad went to prison when I was like six years old and nobody listened to anything I had to say. I didn't have anyone in my life. Mm -hmm. And I tried to find mentors and I tried to find leaders and he grew up a little bit religious and he tried to find some mentorship and leadership that way. And then when he went into business to himself, for himself, he tried to find other people and nobody would actually hear his story. Nobody would hear him out. Um, they would just give him cliches and pat answers. And I was like, the, you know, the, the goosebumps on my arms, you know, started standing up and I was like, man, you could, this is like a Ted talk. This isn't just a marketing pitch. This is like a Ted talk. And for the last couple of months, he's been sharing that story on his, on his podcast and his, in all his marketing, Eric, and it's incredible. The results, the people who want to work with him has just shot through the roof because he's making a real connection to who he is and why he does what he does. So when he tells that story, that founder story, which is what I talk about in the book, people say, oh, he's more than a marketer. This is what he's driven by. I want to work with him. And it's, it's why I told those stories in, in the book about my mom, because it wasn't, I just wanted to help people market and brand their business. It was like, I, I just shared with you right now. I wanted to get out of what I was doing. And that's what drives me, helping people who don't like what they're doing, start a business in coaching, speaking, creators, you know, entrepreneurship in that realm, help them get started because that's why I started. Wow. So it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. Can I use myself kind of like as a guinea pig here? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And for all you guys listening, I mean, here it goes. <laughs> so I was, I was, I was, I started reading your book. I was on a plane. And when I came to the PB3, I um, started actually writing it out, right? I'm like, well, what pisses me off? Because what I've noticed, and here's where for myself, and I'm sure, I, well, I can't be sure, but I'm guessing there are some others that feel that way. I wrote this book. It's about sales. I've been in sales for a while. I get sales. But every time I get hired as somebody's coach, most of the time it gets down to coaching them about their relationship at home. And when I think about what pisses me off, what, what comes to mind is parents who get divorced and the kids get neglected. Like that pisses me off. And then what were the other two questions? What breaks your heart and what's the big problem you're trying to solve? Maybe the, the, there was a kid portion of that that breaks my heart. And the problem I'd like to solve is I personally believe that there's a huge lack of communication that's causing the divorce. It's big egos in the house. It's, well, I'm right, you're wrong type of deal. And I can, help, I can help coach people. But my dilemma is that I'm, I, I may have pigeonholed myself as the sales guy. You know, how do you break? Mm. How do you, I guess, rebrand or how do you just start? And then what do I do with all the stuff that I already got going with sales and the courses that I've created? Does that just stop and you go follow your passion as a relationship coach? You know? No, I, I, I actually, so this is, this is exactly what I do. Um, there are two things that you said that I think you can use as a thread to tie through um, to weave through the stuff that you're doing in sales. You mentioned communication and big egos. So what I would do right now is, I mean, I'm sure those are two huge issues when you train people in sales. Absolutely. Communication and big egos. And if you start teaching your people, your tribe, your audience, your students, your one-on-one -on -one clients, hey, here, here's what I've learned about sales. Um, sales is just a human language. It's a human interaction, you know, and I've learned this, you know, and I don't know, Eric, if you grew up in a divorced home, I did. Uh, so I know the communication and ego are big things, but, um, I would say something along the lines of here's what I've learned from my past, regardless of whatever it is that you do, 
you need to you need to learn how to communicate and you need to learn how to let go of your big ego and when it comes to sales i'm going to teach you this stuff and here's how i learned this and that's the key point like any time that you're creating content, any time that I'm looking at someone's message, trying to market their campaigns, build a campaign or what, I ask them, how did you learn this? And if there were such huge factors, you would probably tell me it's because you grew up around, you know, a divorce, you grew up in a divorced home and you've seen people go through divorces and you've seen this over and over again. So you take what you've learned there and you bring it into the sales world. And what will happen is all these folks will resonate with you, not just because of what you know about sales, but because of how you learned about communication and killing the big ego. You do that for a while. Eventually, you build the brand and people will then follow you to whatever else you do, even if it's outside of sales. A funny thing is happening to me now because of the way that I wrote the book. The way that I wrote the book, it's kind of like a personal development book disguised as a marketing and branding book. And people are asking me and have asked me for, you know, the better part of a year while I was writing it because I was sharing a lot of this content. How did you get through your divorce? How did you reinvent yourself? How did you pick up your life from the ashes? How do you, you know, build relationships again after such a devastating loss? And these are not marketing and branding questions. Just oh, like the not. questions that your clients are asking you are not, yeah, they're not about sales. It's more about their relationship at home and things like that. And so that's why um, I believe it's in chapter two. I talk about the path of the personal brand. Early on, the clarity of me teaching marketing and branding and you teaching sales allows you to attract an audience to you for your expertise. They come for your expertise, but they stay because of who you are and they're willing to follow you on this journey. So I don't actually see them right now as two separate things for you. I would just say weave in the stuff that you've learned about communication and ego, share it in the context of the, the, the future books that you write about sales share them on key, at key, during keynotes, share them on the podcast and people will start to resonate with you a lot more. And dude, I mean, it's sad, but let's be honest, over 50% of marriages end in divorce. So mm -hmm. it's not like you're pigeonholing yourself and, and cutting off a huge portion of the population. Uh, and the people who are married, most of them aren't happy either, you know? So uh, dude, I mean, that's how I would do it. I'm always looking to try to find the thread that's inside you that you can weave into the things that you're already doing. Wow. That is brilliant. That's, that's brilliant. So let me ask you, how did you get into circles? Like with Donald Miller and John Maxwell, like, how did you, how did you come to help huge names like that? Yeah. So, um, so I'll kind of give the non scripted answer. Okay, because I don't talk about this a lot, but I'm just going to be real here because people it. do wonder that and they're afraid to ask. So I'm glad that you asked. Thank you. Um, first, you just have to be really good. You have to be really good at what you do. Like, and what I mean by that is you have to be recommendable. The word recommend means to praise again. Commend means to praise. So I always tell people, if you want to be recommended to other people, you have to be recommendable. You have to look good. You have to have great content. You have to have a great, you know, grasp of what it is that you're doing. You need to raise your level of, or your standard of excellence above everyone else. From the very beginning, when I started in this space, I really invested a lot of time and energy and even money into how my brand looked and what it said. And my goal was, I want the mentors I follow to be able to say, this guy, Mike Kim's stuff is so good, I'm going to share it with my followers. So early on, my mentors were people like Michael Hyatt, who's a leadership author, Ray Edwards. I joined some of their programs. And I was like, I'm just going to do better than everybody else. I'm going to make my content so good that they can't help but recommend me. And they did. Now, I will also say this. It's kind of ironic that a lot of these folks have hired a Korean guy 
to write their content in English. Now I was born in California, so I'm an American in an Asian body, but I felt like that was even more of a reason I had to do better work to stand out. Like how strange is that? We're going to learn copywriting from an Asian guy. And I'm not saying people are racist or anything like that. It's just not the first thing that you would think of, you know? Okay. Um, most people, most people are going to be like, he must be good at math. He's Asian. That's funny. Right? There's, these, there's <laughs> these assumptions and I'm okay with that. Right. I'm but very are you real good at about this stuff. No, I'm terrible at math. Oh my That's God. That's the funny it's thing. Messed up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But early on, I set my standard of excellence to be, I want every blog post and social media post that I share to be on par with Michael Hyatt or Ray Edwards or some of these people I follow. Now, what happened over time is they took notice of me because I was doing good work and I had clarity on what I did. So um, the way that I got the Donald Miller project. Now I had my own brand for years. I was making multiple six figures already, but he met Mike Hyatt and a couple of these other people at a retreat where they were celebrating, um, a, you know, a launch together. And Don was looking for somebody to help him on this project. And he asked his friends, you know, Michael Hyatt and these influential people, who do you guys know that could help me? And they said, you need to hire Mike Kim. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't there at that conversation. I just had quietly been building my brand, raised the bar of excellence over time. And I had clarity on what I did. So he, he contacted me. We ended up working together. John Maxwell is a completely different story. Um, there was a guy named Andrew Manzano who shot a video for me, get this, way back when I was in that music director position at the church. And that was like in 2000, like. 10 2011 and he saw me pivot my career and he saw what i was sharing on social media and what i was doing and remember standard of excellence really high he was shooting video for some members of the john maxwell team and he heard that they needed some marketing help and andrew who i wasn't really close with recommended me to them and he called me and said hey mike i recommended you to the john maxwell people and I'm like, that's cute. Thanks, Andrew. But you're the video guy. They're not going to listen to you, you know? And they did because they checked out my work. They looked at what I was putting out there on my social media, my website, my pod. I had, you know, five years of podcast episodes by then. And Eric, I tell you, when I went into these projects, I didn't come in as a contractor. The positioning was completely different. You know, some people, we, you mentioned you, you hired someone to run your social media. They're a contractor. They're like just supposed to do a job. I mm -hmm. came in as a strategic thinking partner because I had a brand. Wow. I was like, yo, if you don't like me, I'll walk. I don't need your money. Completely different relationship. That's what building a brand can do for you. So now the snowball just grows. It just keeps accumulating, right? I, I have a book. It did really well. I, you know, I build out all these other channels. They do well. That's what branding can do for you. It completely changes your positioning. And that's how I, I landed these contracts. They just found me, but it's that just because so I, I did work. Yeah. All right. So there's somebody listening right now. They have zero brand. Knowing what you know now with your nine years of experience, what would you do differently or how would you start right now if you had no brand? I would, um, if I had no brand, like no email list, nobody knew who I was, whatnot. Here's uh, two things I would do. Number one, I would run a virtual summit. And I know that's a strange answer, but yeah. I would get a bunch of people. Like if I was going into like HR, for example, I'm not a corporate guy. I haven't been corporate in over 12, 13 years. Right. But if I was going into corporate and wanted to consult for companies in HR, I would call you know, as many people as I could, who I could find on LinkedIn or online, I would invest and in, create a great landing page and great messaging and host a virtual summit. And I would just interview these people. The reason I would do that is number one, it would elevate my authority because I'm like the host of this summit. Number two, I'm building relationships with all these people because I'm interviewing them. And number three, uh, I'm creating content around the summit by interviewing them. 
A fourth benefit is that I would grow my email list. Now, once I had that done, I would break down the content and I would run Facebook ads to grow my email list to the summit. And all things being equal, if I had the same skill level, but zero brand, like you asked, that's mm -hmm. exactly what I would do. I would interview, you know, a 10 to 15 experts. I have all the content that I need for a podcast, for Instagram, for YouTube. I can monetize the summit. I can grow my email list and I can elevate my authority and my influence. And I don't know anything about HR. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> learn more from actually interviewing these people, but that's literally what I would do if I started all over again, um, okay. all things being equal, you know, well, and, and that's what I would do. Well, this is, this is confidence of nine years of working with some big names. I mean, you're saying, so your mind went to, yeah, virtual summit summit. And my mind went to, I don't even know what the hell a virtual summit is or how to start one. Yeah. That will never happen. So let's say you, you know, you don't have the confidence of the, the Mike Kim, the veteran, and you're just starting out. What would you do? So if I was just starting out and I've said this to some friends of mine, cause they're like, how do I start doing what you do? I would say, pick your favorite social media platform, whatever that is, the one that you use the most for a lot of people, it's Instagram, you know, Instagram or Facebook are usually the most. And I would, I would tell them just share insights on those platforms because you already know how to use that channel. You already know how to use Instagram or Facebook, right? Pick the, pick your favorite one. And they'll say, well, nobody's going to listen to me. I'm like, that doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you exercise this muscle of self-expression and of sharing your ideas. Remember earlier, I said, it's hard to sell something if you have, if you have nothing to say. And for most of us who come out of corporate or out of some other background, we're not used to sharing what we know. We're not used to sharing our thoughts on things. So then they might say, well, Instagram is, you know, have to be, all the pictures have to be so pretty. And I'm like, no, no, just use Instagram stories. Just literally just open your phone and talk about what you learned or some book that you're reading and share about it. And over time, you're going to get better and better and better at doing that. Right. I would start there. Then once you get a little bit more used to sharing your ideas, you can share them on platforms that are a little bit more attuned to your audience. For example, I don't really like using LinkedIn, but a lot of my audience uses LinkedIn. So I have to get used to using LinkedIn. Um, so I've, I've been dabbling in that more. Uh, I've been dabbling in video more. I'm not a good video editor, you know, but I'm like, hey, I got to learn it at some point. So let me fool around with TikTok and creating Instagram reels. And every time I do it, I just get a little bit better and a little bit more comfortable to the point that, dude, by Christmas time, you know, in four months, three months, I'm going to be really good at it. And I think that's one thing that we don't understand that the one, no one can take away the skill and the experience from you. If you start, then if you launch a podcast in six months, it's going to be so much easier. Like, dude, I, I, you know, I congratulate you on the podcast. I tell everybody, start a Thank podcast. You. It's only going to make you better. But I didn't start my podcast until a year after I started, you know, blogging. And I talk about in the book, like how I added one critical skill set per year. 2013 was the year I started blogging. 2014, I started podcasting, but I didn't stop blogging. And that year of blogging helped me podcast so much better. Year number three, um, 2015, was the year of starting group coaching. And I was able to fill the group coaching because I had a blog for two years and a podcast for one year. You see how it works? And it just stacked. Wow. People look at me now and they're like, oh, you have a blog, you have a podcast, you have product launches, you have masterminds, you wrote a book, you have live events. I'm like, that didn't happen in one shot. Success is sequential, not simultaneous. So if you're really starting from zero and you really don't feel like you have the skill set, start with your favorite social media app, share a few thoughts, what you're learning, who you're learning from, a book that you're reading, and just exercise that muscle of sharing with people what you're learning. 
and then it can build up over time. Yeah. And the other thing, and I know we got about three minutes because I know you have a meeting to go to. But the one thing that really stood out to me that you said is said, you said, don't build your brand, become your brand. Do the hard work required to become the person you're trying to sell people to. Embrace integrity. There's no shortcut. And I'm like, okay, you're different. You're a different guy because I saw, I was just going through your like videos on Facebook and I think there's during quarantine. That's why I said he's hilarious to follow in quarantine. You walk out on a balcony with your phone. Now, now everybody I follow who's got any kind of following, they're very careful about staying out of politics, not trying to offend anybody there, you know, and I'm not saying that you're out there, you know, talking about politics or anything but you literally came out on a balcony and this is an adult show and this was the scene from coming to america <laughs> you're like good morning neighbors you scream at the top of my lungs and i don't know if it was a soundtrack or if somebody actually said hey fuck you and you're like yes yes fuck you too i i died laughing when i saw that <laughs> and that was just you being you and I think a lot of people, you can tell they're not authentic. They're teaching just because they just heard it somewhere or they read it. They want to teach it to look like they're something. What's the importance about that authenticity? And what should people care about and not care about when they're going live or doing videos? Yeah, I mean, in that context, everyone was going crazy because we were all locked down, <laughs> you know, during the quarantine. So like there was context to that, right? Right. Um, everyone knew that all of us were locked in the house. And yeah, I, I look like I just woke up because I did. And that whole audio track is from the movie. You know, he says, fuck you, fuck you too. So that's actually from the soundtrack. A lot of people have never seen that movie. So they thought I actually said it. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> why? Do I sound like Eddie Murphy? I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's funny. But here's what I would say in all seriousness about it. There are three reasons that people tune in to any kind of content. And these three reasons, you know, they, they go in any order. It's not that one is more important than the other, but we, we tune into content for either um, number one, education, number two, inspiration, or number three, entertainment. Think about it. You watch mm -hmm. something on Netflix, you're, you're, you're watching because you want to be entertained or you want to learn something. Maybe it's a documentary, right? You go on YouTube and you Google, you, you type in how to do something. You're trying to learn something. You watch, you know, Tony Robbins or some of these motivational people and, and they're there to inspire you, right? So when it comes to our personal brands, um, all of us are going to major on one of the three things. I am primarily an educational guy. People come to me to learn about marketing. But if all I do is teach all the time, it's going to be very dry. Nobody likes to have a friend who just teaches them all the time. <laughs> like, true. we don't want to hang out with that guy that know it all. Like, shut up, dude. Right. <laughs> so once in a while, you have to mix in this inspirational content and some entertaining stuff and build, be willing to like laugh at yourself a little bit. Right. Um, how many times do we watch a, a movie and we watch the blooper reel after the movie? We, we do this. Even if it's a serious movie or serious TV show, we want to see that side of how it was created. So that post was just meant to be entertaining, but it was also just how I felt at the time. You know, I was bored. I had nothing else to do. We were all locked down. Inspirational content, you know, more recently when I had, you know, first got the, the copies of my book, I showed it to my mom and she hates being on camera here. And so I was like, whatever, I'm just going to film her and I'm going to ask for, for forgiveness later. It was that, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And she was like, really emotional about seeing my book and I shared it. I was not teaching anything. I didn't say, this is how you build a brand or this is how you sell your book, but people really engaged with that content because it was inspirational. It was very touching to them and had people say, I feel like I got to know you better. Yeah. Like that's really important in marketing. I feel like I see a different side of you. That's really important in marketing. Um, there actually is a lot that happened in that post. People figured out, like, my mom actually likes me. I have a good relationship with my mom. It's important. My family's important to me. And these are all things that play into what people think about Mike Kim, the coach, and Mike Kim, the speaker, and Mike Kim, the content creator. These 
things speak to them about me in a good way. So now my brand is a little bit more well-rounded. I still 90% of the time teach content, but that other 10%, I share something that's inspirational. I share a story. Um, I tell people about an experience. Uh, one of the things that I like to do, I just, I just like to document where I'm traveling. And subconsciously what's happening to people when they consume that content is they think, wow, Mike really can do whatever he wants in terms of travel. He really has built a business around his lifestyle. He's not BSing it. There's no way this dude to travel this much if he really didn't have a legit business doing what he loves from the road. He's a true digital nomad. And that deep in their mind sort of makes them feel like, I think he knows what he's talking about. So it's a very subconscious thing, but it's, it's, it's important. It's all real. It's all there. Wow. Mike, well, look, thank you for coming and sharing a piece of Mike Kim with us today. I thought this was a great conversation. I wish I could talk to you all day and just pick your brain and learn from you. If, uh, if you guys are still with us, definitely check out his podcast and get the book. You are the brand. If you're in any kind of business, get that book. It's uh, on sale on Amazon or I think I heard you. Um, are you donating anything to Love 146 if people buy from your website? Yeah. Yeah. So what we're doing now, what we did during the book launch, Love 146 is a nonprofit organization that provides care for kids rescued out of the sex trade. It's, you know, it's awful what, what's happening to these kids. Um, and I've been supporting them for years personally. And so what we're doing is we're donating a portion of the book proceeds. Actually, everyone who bought the book through my store during the launch, we're taking all that money and giving it to one, Love 146. But now moving forward, now that the launch is done, buy the book anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you want. And we're taking a portion of the sales and donating it to Love 146. So uh, go ahead, pick up a copy. I hope that you guys find it useful. Um, and we're just trying to, we're trying to do our part. To, to make a difference in the world, you know, you beyond are, just our own business, you know, so. And if you, um, if you need an inspirational story and you want to understand why that organization was named Love 146, which girl it was named after, I get chill bumps because I listened to that podcast interview you had. Go back to Mike's podcast, Brand You Podcast, and find the episode with the CEO of Love 146. Um, you're probably going to end up crying like I did. <laughs> Mike, yeah. thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Have a wonderful day. Eric.